Annyeonghaseyo! Welcome to Afternoon of Delight, where Leah, Megan, and Amy, three American romance novelists discussing all things K-romance from a writer's lens. We fangirl over our favorite actors and actresses, talk up our trope addictions, and nerd out on K-drama deep dives. We'll throw in a few K-pop and K-skincare wrecks for good measure, because why not ride the how you wave all the way to shore? So grab some duck bookie and listen to your new favorite unease. <laughs> hey, everybody! <laughs> <laughs> that could not have been better timed. <laughs> that was amazing. He's, He's like, like, me too. You fin- I finished the intro and yes. <laughs> Our cat. Amazing. Our cat said hello. Hello. Well, hello, everyone. So what's going on today? So I want to talk about a little something. And this is not, I mean, it is. It's a plug for a product, but it's a product that I absolutely love and that I've talked both of you into. So I think it's worthy of discussion, but also from an emotional standpoint, why I love this product. So we've talked, I think we've brought it up on here before about the Oculus and working out with the (laughs) Oculus with this app called Supernatural. Um, Don't rub it in. Don't rub it in. Yeah. Well, someday, someday, Leah, you will be part of, you're going to be part of the exclusive club that is me and Megan Um, and Neil, me and Megan and Neil. And Neil. (laughs) So I, I started using the, I bought myself an Oculus for gaming purposes because I found a couple games that I liked on my son's Oculus. And then I found Supernatural like March of last year, March of 2020. So like really like right when the pandemic hit and I'm like, I'm going to try this out because I'm stuck in the house for, you know, who knows how long and fell in love with this app. And I don't talk about it a ton with people who don't do Supernatural because I I don't know. I feel like people are going to be like, you can't, like, there's no way you're getting something like a healthy benefit out of wearing a VR headset and swinging your arms around, but you do. Um, And I'm not afraid to, to, you know, shout its praises right now. But the reason why I'm bringing it up today is because Supernatural has been having an effect on me that is like very similar to K-dramas as far as like emotional catharsis, which I, I know sounds odd to say about working out, but I think a lot of people can relate to the emotional highs and lows of exercising when you really are into it and you kind of get into like flow state. So for various reasons, it was a rough week, a rough weekend, a rough start to the week emotionally. And I've talked on here before about how I do not emote very well, something that I'm working on, but I don't emote very well. And K-dramas has helped me through that because they are an emotional catharsis for me. So I had a rough weekend. I was feeling my feels and I didn't want to feel my feels and I didn't want to work out, but I'm like, you know what? I'm going to put on the headset because Megan's going to beat me in points this week. And I don't, and I'm too competitive even when I'm feeling like shit and lost in my feelings. So I put on the headset and there's always a new workout every day on Supernatural, the workout of the day. And I don't always do the workout of the day on that day because if it's not a playlist that I'm like totally jazzed about, then I'm like, I'm going to move on and do one that I I already know that I like. But I opened up Supernatural and uh, the workout of the day was by one of my favorite coaches because they have coaches who like talk you through the workouts, which I love. And so it was a workout by my favorite, one of my favorite coaches, Coach Duana. And the track list, I'll just read you the track list. It's Fix You by Coldplay, Secrets by One Republic. My Body by Young the Giant, Pompeii by Bastille, and Viva La Vida by Coldplay. And I knew as soon as I saw that it started with Fix You that I'm like, I'm going to be one of those people that cries when she works out today if I do this, (laughs) if I do this one. But I'm like, I want to try it because it's also, it was like a a medium level workout, which is like the highest one that I usually do. And it's called Power, which means it was going to be like a tough workout. So I do this workout and it makes me like very emotional and, but also like made me feel great when I was done with it because I had like blasted through my feelings with this amazing workout. And then I did it again today because I was telling Megan about it. And I'm like, okay, first of all, this is like a really emotional workout, which is weird. And second of all, It's one of the hardest ones I've done. And Megan and I do the medium level workouts all the time. And it's one of the hardest ones I've done. And I was exhausted. And it's like one of my lowest scores I've ever gotten on a medium, which doesn't matter because I worked out and whatever. But I'm like, I'm going to try it again today because I'm in a better frame of mind today. 
And I wanted to be a total dork and like pause during the workout and jot down notes of like some of the things that the coach says and why I think it's awesome. So in Fix You, if you have not listened to the lyrics of Fix You, just go, you know, listen to it, read it. Like you'll understand why it's a song that makes you feel some feel some feels. But in the beginning of the workout, when it's kind of like amping up, she pops in and she says, you know, it feels powerful to be vulnerable. So use that like power of your vulnerability to get through this song. And that's when I was like, ah, okay, Tawana, I'll do it, you know? <laughs> and then you move through the playlist and it gets, you know, it, it gets more upbeat and stuff like that. But then the second song is Secrets by One Republic. And then she's, she, says, she says, you know, when those things happen that you want to keep secret, don't share them and share with others, what got you through it too. And I was like, Oh my God, like this is freaking therapy, you know, like, cause I don't, I don't talk to people, but I talk to you guys. Like I told you, I told you all my feels this week and, uh, and I'm happy that I did, but it was just, you know, it was some weird things that I needed to hear through a workout. And this, what, what I'm trying to like, kind of bring back to like, Hey, dramas and stuff is I'm not a religious person by nature, but I do believe in the power of the universe and the universe putting things in our path when we need them. And I feel like the universe did that for me with Korean dramas, like when the pandemic, you know, was in full swing. And then it did it in bringing us together to do this podcast about K dramas because this literally is my therapy every week. And then, same. And then the universe threw, like, I, I already had Supernatural going, but like, it threw Megan in my path where we're talking about supernatural, like almost every day. And then it threw this playlist mm -hmm. in my path, like literally on the day that I needed it. And so I think it mm -hmm. all just goes to say that we find these things that bring us emotional catharsis, but also joy. And that is what K drama is for me. And that is what this podcast is for me and supernatural. Now you can sponsor us. <laughs> right? yeah. and, Megan, and Megan did the workout today as research. Yeah, I did because, I well, it was interesting because, like, Amy, so again, Amy doesn't, like, yeah, she doesn't really publicly emote, <laughs> which is uh, totally fine, but that's just not, like, the way she is. And if she posts on social media, it's not to, like, tell stories about herself. It's usually to, like, brag about her kids or talk about her books or something. And I noticed that after she did the workout, she posted on, like, her personal Instagram this, like, post that was just a little like I haven't seen Amy post and I was really proud of her because it was I like that I, was sharing, was very, I was sharing my feelings for sure yeah because she was clearly very inspired by the workout and she mentioned like Kate Rob is in it too she was just like look like hi to some of my friends you know I just things have been a little hard but I feel like I want to share that they've been hard and that that's okay and that these are the things that are helping me get through and I was just really proud of you Amy for doing that because I know that that's not really natural for no, you it's not but then I did the workout today because I was like damn <laughs> maybe like I, I could use some therapy <laughs> and I totally got it was interesting because as the coach was talking today I was like oh my god now I know why Amy felt the way she did like oh boy and it was it was it was very hard physically but it did I did kind of feel like I'd gone through therapy when I was done I kind of like sat in a chair after I was done and I was like huh I just kind of like sat in like my feels for a yeah. little bit after that workout. So yeah, it's just, we all find things that kind of get us through and it's nice when there's like multiple things, but it's nice to find, and it's nice to find community in it too, which I think also brings us back right. to this podcast to, you know, watching K-dramas and talking about K-dramas, how it's been therapeutic for us to, you know, our, our Patreon that we have going where we've got an awesome community going there. And, and we're so grateful for those of you that have joined us over on Patreon as well. Like it's just yeah. this, this sort of communal catharsis that we get through K dramas. And mm -hmm. it, it just, it kind of blows my mind that like, I didn't have this a year ago, you know, like it was, right. it's literally like right about this time that I started watching K dramas in 2020. Yeah. Yeah. What was I doing? How was I dealing? And I think that the point I want to make, because I have decided to invest in an Oculus, even though it's not something that is in full alignment with my household's values, apparently, if anyone goes back to whatever podcast we talked about my husband's feelings about the Oculus. But this is the point I want to make here that I'm hearing from you, Amy, and that I think is something that probably resonates with you too, Megan, and also for like a lot of folks who've been like listening with us and connecting and have other spaces they're in, is... I think that if you're in communities that 
come together intentionally, but they're not in person, that doesn't mean that they're not as important or as real or as valuable. And I think that sometimes you don't know that if you're not in those spaces. And so you don't understand it. And it's easy to trivialize like, oh, that's just like an online thing. And it's like, yes, Mm -hmm. but like we're all real people. And like these are ways to connect and build relationships (laughs) in ways where, Mm -hmm. yeah, I can have honestly like fulfillment and human interactions that like are bringing me joy with people that, you know, I've never met before. And it's a totally valid and healthy thing. <laughs> Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I, I mean, like, agree. so yeah, we know each other all personally now, but we didn't start out that way. Like we met each other in online spaces and became right. really, you know, good friends before ever meeting each other in, in real life. And so I, I don't think that anybody should ever discount the value that you find in any sort of online relationship. And yeah, I mean, you I mean, you, you hit it on the head, Leah, like that's exactly what it is. And once you get your Oculus and you start doing Supernatural, I think that you will understand it better and be able to defend it to the naysayer so much mm-hmm. more. Yeah. And you know what? And if not, it's okay. I can live my own truth. And I think this segues me into yeah. the next thing we wanted to talk about for this podcast, which is kind of the elephant in the room that's come up recently, um, as in like under 24 hours ago. <laughs> which is today we're going to be talking about um, startup. And obviously there have been like a lot of allegations that have come out about, you know, one of the main characters who's in startup, Kim Sun Ho, and fallout from obviously messy um, personal relationship that he was in. And I think what I want to say about it is we're not going to really get into the, to a discourse on like what is happening for him right now and what this controversy is simply because A, it's brand new and we don't really know and by the time like you listen to this it's going to be dated and yeah so really that's it that's just it there's just a (laughs) but b the next point i have to make about it i think that ties in is i also just want to acknowledge that for some people this is like distressing news and that's okay too because again when we're like having entertainment and when we're connecting with things like it's okay to have like emotional investments and you know, a, a lot of us have found, oh my gosh, my cat is playing with a toy to the side. Um, <laughs> and a lot of us have found connection, like celebrating like some of the shows that this actor has been in. And so I think right. beyond separating from like, you know, the actor and whatever may or may not have happened on his end, it like leaves that weird feeling in our spaces to be like, oh, well, we're about to kind of like go into like a deep dive on this podcast. And now we all kind of can acknowledge that in real life, potentially this this person may have acted in ways that were like not great. However, like we still want to be able to like talk about the work and have it be separate, but still also not be like completely insensitive to the fact that we don't like when people act like, you know, toxic. So it's a bit muddled. We don't have great answers. So we're navigating this the best that we can. And I think the one thing that we probably can do is maybe in a future, um, podcast of some sort talk a little bit more about what I think we can speak to which is some of our feelings about what it means to like be a fan of Korean music and Korean drama understanding that there is an element to that fandom spaces that's kind of being handled through like the corporate side of it that feels quite toxic and problematic with the expectations that we're putting on you know, the music idols and now the actors as well to kind of live these very like sterile, neutered lives for public consumption. So apparently we can all like project our fantasies on them as like available. I'm not really sure. I think it's a whole other conversation to have that's not for today. All we're going to say for today is we know this has happened. Obviously, it kind of like makes us all interact with that information in different ways. However, we're not going to like weigh in on it right now because we're not in a position to do so. Very well put. Yep. Yep. But we will weigh in on startup. Yeah, Yeah. we will weigh in on startup. (laughs) Today, we're going to talk about the drama startup. All right, here we go. An earnest 20-something heroine who wants to make her mark on the world. An estranged sister who is now the heroine's foil. First love, new love, unrequited love, a Cyrano trope, a meddling but well-meaning granny, a love triangle with two worthy heroes, but only one can get the girl. Mix it all together, and what do you get? Startup. The 2020 Studio Dragon Netflix K-drama starring Bae Suzy, Kim Sun Ho, Nam Joo Hyuk, and Kang Hana that has had viewers equally swooning and up in arms for almost a year. 
and your afternoonas cannot wait to dive in. But first, we're going to keep it spoiler free for those of you who still need to binge this deliciously addicting drama. So non-spoiler section, if you haven't watched this drama, you can still keep listening. So before we get started on the drama itself, we want to make sure everyone is familiar with the Cyrano trope, which stems from the 1897 French play by Edmund Rostand called Cyrano de Bergerac. In short, Wikipedia describes the play as such. Hercule Savignan de Cyrano de Bergerac, a cadet, a nobleman serving as a soldier in the French army, is a brash, strong-willed man of many talents. In addition to being a remarkable duelist, he is a gifted, joyful poet and is also a musical artist. However, he has an obnoxiously large nose, which causes him to doubt himself. This doubt prevents him from expressing his love for his distant cousin, the beautiful and intellectual Roxanne, as he believes that his ugliness would prevent him the dream of being loved by even an ugly woman. When Roxanne tells him that she is in love with Christian, another cadet in the army, Cyrano is crushed but promises to look after Christian for his cousin. And when Christian reveals to Cyrano that he is in love with Roxanne but is basically an epic fail when it comes to wooing, Cyrano finds himself agreeing to woo Roxanne via letters on Christian's behalf. The rest of the play is actually quite tragic, so we won't go there. But two main tokens from the play have withstood the test of time. One, the word panache, which is now part of our own vernacular, and two, countless retellings of the Cyrano trope from the 1987 movie Roxanne starring Steve Martin as the large-nosed Charlie who woos Roxanne, Daryl Hannah, for more classically good-looking Chris, to the 2018 Netflix rom-com Set It Up with Zoe Deutsch and Glenn Powell as overworked assistants who Cyrano their bosses, yet end up falling for each other. And coming in December, because I found this in my research on Cyrano retellings, there is actually going to be a Cyrano de Bergerac musical starring Peter Dinklage as Cyrano, and I cannot freaking wait to see that. And now we have it again in Startup with Hanji Pyong, a teen orphan, at the urging of a grieving Dalmi's grandmother, writing letters to Dalmi using the name Nam Do San, a young boy who was in the paper for having won the math Olympiad and seemed to be the pride and joy of his parents, a life Ji Pyong, better known as Good Boy, envied. Basically, Cyrano was just catfishing before we called it catfishing, all in the name of love. Which leads me to my first question. Is the Cyrano trope romantic or cruel? So, you know, I'm obviously I'm never a fan of deception. I mean, <laughs> who is? <laughs> Who's like, yes, deceive me. But this trope, I, I don't know, it doesn't strike me as cruel, which I guess is the only reason I'm willing to tolerate the deception for a while. I mean, the truth must come out eventually for me to like really be all in. As long as the feelings are true and the Christian character genuinely loves the Roxanne character but isn't quite confident in his wooing skills, I can handle it. So, I mean, I would say it's not my fave and I definitely need to see the Cyrano character own up to the deception and grow a little bit. I mean, in Startup, I was clearly okay with it because I like the drama. <laughs> There's a spoiler. I like the drama. We'll get to it. We all did. So like, yeah, spoiler. We all liked yeah. Startup. So we're all okay with it in that respect. So I think what's interesting here is that, you know, we do have a bit of a reversal where, you know, it's the seemingly rich and powerful and handsome man who is secretly sitting on this throne of emotional boo-boos and ro ruling over an entire empire of being damaged. Um, so he's the Cyrano. <laughs> And he's the one coaching the more inexperienced and nerdy hero. So Cyrano is complicated, like heroic and talented, but ultimately he's a person like fearful of rejection, even though he really is a worthy suitor. And given that he's basically like the ultimate second male lead jacked up to Hulk-like levels, he makes the audience really sympathetic to him, which I think feels like part of the reason why Han Ji Pyong has this very loyal vocal fan base who you know, up until now, have wanted to curl up in his dimples and make it all better. <laughs> yeah, I do love the whole reversal part of it and how, you know, in other Cyrano retellings, it's usually somebody who physically does not look the part of the hero, but in all other aspects is. Whereas here we have a man who looks very much the part of the hero, but is very broken inside and for that reason, isn't able to, you know, show his full self. So yeah, I, I mean, I thought it was well done. Like, I'm not complaining about it. I don't like deception either. But like Megan, like you said, I think when it's done without cruel intentions, 
that you're right. able intentions yes, matter sometimes they do. You know? i mean even do. even though intention doesn't have anything to do with how it's received by the person you know who's being deceived i do think that intention matters because there isn't anything cruel about what they're doing everything they are doing is because of their love for dalmi um it mm. doesn't excuse it but i think it makes mm. us more sympathetic to it it's kind of like G. Pyong's big nose is like on the yeah. inside. Yeah. And also, I think, you know, <laughs> we're able to see it works, I think, in this type of drama. Like sometimes what drives me crazy in other dramas I've talked about have been like, let's say in Lawless or Lawyer or other things where like all the behind the scenes stuff is getting worked out for the viewer. In this case, where like deception is kind of one of the main plot drivers. I excuse it more because I'm part of like, in this case, I'm in on it as like a viewer so i'm like being able to see those motivations and being more sympathetic to it so in this case this is a thing where Mm. you kind of do need to be in on like the behind the scenes as a as a viewer it's a good point okay so sandbox the fictional startup incubator from the drama and the focal point for much of the show is located on the not so fictional nodal island an artificial island located in the heart of seoul's financial district in the middle of the han river The land used to be a farm, but was converted into a cultural center amidst the bustling city by Urban Transformer, a South Korean city planning startup. See that connection there? So what are your thoughts on how this setting worked or didn't work as the focal point for Seoul's fictional Silicon Valley? Okay, so I decided to tackle (laughs) this because... A, I live, you know, on the doorstep to Silicon Valley and also because it's like a nerdy question. And I was like, well, actually, because in the drama, they kept referring <laughs> tell to us, tell us now, as sound. like yeah. <laughs> Silicon Valley. And I was like, well, actually, <laughs> the sandbox is an incubator. So an incubator is essentially like a collaborative program for startups. And it's usually physically located in one central workplace And it's designed to help startups in their infancy succeed by providing workspaces, seed funding, mentoring, and training. So in this case, logically, like the sandbox checks out. It's an incubator, even though it felt like it had like a Saved by the Bell setting to it because (laughs) it was like very cheesily (laughs) like decor. But like, okay, it was like hip and edgy if you were like, you know. Oh my God, now their offices, their offices are like, the, whatever what was the restaurant in Saved by the Bell that's what the office is yeah like. the not the oh, peach pit uh, that's uh that's, I was gonna say the peach pit that's 90210 yeah wasn't that like Max oh yeah Max was it Max's yeah Max's. yeah I mean, yeah I it was, it was trying to be cool but it obviously was dorky but like whatever <laughs> I'm fine it's not like I'm like super cool but anyway it 100% isn't Silicon Valley because that's like a large geographical area. And some fun facts is, you know, so Silicon Valley is south of San Francisco. Its largest city is San Jose, um, which is actually more populous than the, you know, maybe better known famous San Francisco. And it's the 10th most populous city in the country. And Silicon Valley used to just be known as Santa Clara Valley or the rather lovely Valley of the Heart's Delight. And it was famous for having like lots of orchards and dun 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 stanford university aka the harvard of the west and basically the tldr in all of this is that stanford attracted smart people and in the late 50s they pioneered silicon microchips which are the brains of computing devices and the rest is history and if you drive around silicon valley now you're gonna see headquarters to places like apple facebook and google so it's like a big area it's not like one building (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> right. um, but I did look up a single incubator, Y Combinator, and that's an incubator located in um, Palo Alto, also where Stanford's located and, you know, probably one of the more famous towns in Silicon Valley. And what companies have been incubated in this place? Let's see. I'm guessing you've heard of a few. Airbnb, DoorDash, Dropbox, Instacart, Reddit, Twitch, and then some I haven't heard like Fizz, which is a idea to have a debit card for college students that helps them build credit or digistain which helps breast cancer patients avoid unnecessary chemotherapy or playhouse which is pitched as tiktok for real estate so i mean as i was like looking through different things that have been incubated there i was like it made me feel like sandbox vibes where you know people had big ideas and they were like trying to find like ways to make them happen so this incubator provides startups with seed funding and assists them in refining these big ideas and they can also help them learn to develop pitches for investors they host demo days where the startups can present their products and services to invited investors in the press so again not to be a curmudgeon but to be a curmudgeon 
The Sandbox is just a single incubator in the heart of Seoul, but it's not Silicon Freaking Valley. <laughs> <laughs> but I like that I like that you wanted to detail about like the difference between incubators and like the whole area of Silicon Valley because I was wondering how realistic this incubator was, and like I don't understand things outside the realm of education and writing because those are my two worlds, and so that was very interesting for me, and it was a learning experience. And just to clarify, I Googled it while you were giving that fantastic explanation. And the restaurant in Saved by the Bell is called The Max. There. Yeah. Okay. I thought it was something Max. Way to go, Megan. And the offices in Sandbox look like The Max. <laughs> I mean, and it was just like the colors as you walk in and like the post-it notes. Like, I mean, it's fine. But I was a little bit like, I don't know. <laughs> look, when, when, Neil, when Neil was younger, his biggest crush was Tiffany Amber Thiessen. Okay. Yeah, he loved Kelly Kapowski. I mean, I loved Kelly Kapowski, so... Who didn't yeah. love Kelly Kapowski? <laughs> and oh was it... I gosh. just remember when Jesse... Jesse took speed. Remember when Jesse yes. took speed? And yes. Like, <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> that I was like Jesse one of those like, after-school special themes. <laughs> it was a... Yes, it was oh, very God. much an after-school special. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so finally, without being too spoilery yet, let's talk about the role of women in this drama, as it does showcase a lot of strong women in various aspects of South Korean life, from Bae Suzy as, as Sadalmi, to Kang Hana as Wan In Jae, to Stephanie Lee as Jong Saha, to our beloved Kim Hae Suk as Dalmi's grandmother, Choi Wan Duk. Which female character resonated with you the most, and why? So I really loved In Jae, Dalmi's sister. So especially as the drama progressed mainly because she never really changed or softened who she was to fit anyone's idea of who she should be. So without giving anything away, I will say that even toward the end of the drama, she was still tough and a little cold and she was very realistic, very practical. While Dalmi was definitely a dreamer, NJ was incredibly ambitious, strategic and like Again, practical, the opposite of re reckless. She didn't take risks. And in a way, she was the main push and inspiration for Dalmi until Dosan came along. So I really, really liked Saha uh, and her whole like little love story. But really, like if we're going to have to pick like who resonates the most overall, I'm going with Choi Wan Juk, the granny. Because, look, she coined the term good boy and thus created a legend that has lived oh, on wow. in social media for like a year. <laughs> so and she's also really fantastic in um, Hospital Playlist where she's, you know, she's just she's got an amazing plot thread throughout Hospital Playlist. I will say that I feel like honors really well. Actually, here's one thing I want to point out is that I do think that K-drama does a pretty darn good job of sometimes very much humanizing and centering older people, especially older women. And I feel yes, like absolutely that's silenced a lot in like a lot of our um, like our shows. You know, there might be like an older person around, but like, you know, whatever. They're kind of played for laughs. And like in this, I feel like as I've watched K-dramas, the Halmonies often are like my favorite parts of it. Like they're wise. They usually have like some meat to their roles. And um, and so, yeah, I felt like this grandma really had that. I thought she was a very built out, nuanced character. And the same actress, you know, I thought brought a lot of sensitivity and nuance into her performance in Hospital Playlist as well. I loved her her thread or her journey in Hospital Playlist. Like it was one of my favorite storylines. So I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm excited. And it's like for, an older yeah. woman. Yeah. <laughs> I'm excited to talk about that because I like, it was one of those things. And, and I, I think we brought that up before. I don't know if we've brought it up just in our chats about hospital playlist or, um, well, yeah, we haven't talked about it on here yet, but like, it's one of those things when you find an ensemble drama and there's never a time where when they're focusing on one storyline that you're like, oh, I wish they would get back to such and such storyline. Like every single storyline mattered and every single character mattered in like the main core of characters. I will, I mean, like obviously things happen in the hospital and every, you know, episode and stuff like that. But like, yeah, her, her so her name is Rosa in Hospital Playlist and I loved her storyline. And there was never a time where when it was focusing on her that I was like, oh, I wish it would get back to like a younger person or somebody else's story. So it was really well done and and the same in this too. And bringing her like back I guess to like the startup thing is I felt like, you know, in her coining of good boy, 
in some ways she like blessed and saved him and in some ways she cursed him i think he felt like before his arc like finished executing that she had kind of cursed him as well with the name because it felt like this promise that he felt like he wasn't worthy of and couldn't deliver and it actually made him upset but i felt like she she was recognizing him as much more she you know she had the wisdom of years she's looking at this person and she's seeing what he can't see about himself and isn't that always just like a lovely thing when someone sees like the good parts of you that you don't actually know are there i love that yeah so let's get to our favorite part of every uh podcast which is our k wreck of the week what do you have for us this week megan with k-pop so i cannot believe i didn't know this so don't yell at me <laughs> but a Susie is a former idol that like made my day and um i have heard of the group she's in I just didn't realize she was in it. So anyway, this week I'm recommending Goodbye Baby by Miss A. And yes, our dear Bay Susie is in the group. It's just a really fun pop hit. I mean, it's, it's like 10 years old or something like that. And it's just fantastic. I will put it on our Spotify playlist. Um, and I think, you know, check out the video. Susie looks amazing. She has this little like cat outfit on. She's great. So yeah, check it out. And you can find our Spotify playlist on our website, right? Yep, at uh, www.afternoonadelight.com. You can find everything there. Everything about us. Well, you know what it means after Megan gives her K-Rec. We are moving on to the spoiler section. So pause it if you don't want us to ruin everything that happens in startup for you. Or come along for the ride because you just don't care. You want to hear us talk about Namdo-san versus Good Boy. Or when I say us, I mean <laughs> Megan, <laughs> who has a literary thesis for y'all. All right, let's just dive into the part everyone has been waiting for, the good boy, Hanji Pyong slash Nam Do San debate. But first, if you're still listening and haven't watched Startup, we'll outline the complicated Cyrano plot in hopes you can follow along. Also, spoilers will abound. Han Ji Pyong was a troubled teen orphan who was briefly taken in by Mrs. Choi, Dalmi's grandma, when he was emancipated from the orphanage. When Dalmi's parents divorce and Dalmi's sister moves to the States with her mom, while Dalmi stays with her dad, Choi Wan Duck enlists Ji Pyong, who she has nicknamed Good Boy, to write Dalmi letters so that she has something to focus on other than divorce. Because Ji Pyong doesn't think his name carries any weight, he signs the letters as Nam Do San, adopting the persona of the young math Olympiad winner whose name Ji Pyong saw in the newspaper. Later, when Mrs. Choi's son slash Dalmi's father dies after a tragic accident that was so obviously foreshadowed and could have been avoided if the guy would have just waited to cross the street, I, get, <laughs> I have some feelings about this. Dalmi is comforted by her pen pal, Nam Do San. Fast forward 15 years, and Dalmi, who is still floundering and finding a career, reunites with her estranged sister, Inje, who is a rich and successful CEO. The two do nothing but throw shade and try to one-up each other, to the extent where Dalmi claims she will be at a networking event with Nam Do San, the pen pal Inje claims Dalmi has never met, which is 100% true, because the two are starting a business together. Enter Han Ji Pyong, now a rich and successful entrepreneur who is once again tapped by Mrs. Choi to come to Dalmi's rescue, this time by finding someone named Nam Do San, ideally the Nam Do San from the newspaper article 15 years ago, to play the part. But as the endeavor gets messy and Granny realizes this could be a disaster and break Dalmi's heart, she tries to call it off, but too late. Dalmi finds Nam Do San herself, and he is not the success she expects him to be. So the ruse is back on. Granny begs Good Boy to fix Dosan up and have him play the part so Dalmi can face Inje. But in the end, Dosan and Good Boy are at an impasse when Good Boy basically shits on Samsung Tech, Dosan's <laughs> startup, and says he will never succeed. The only problem? Ji Pyong has given Dosan all of Dalmi's letters so he can study up and be the Dosan of her past. And as soon as Dosan reads the letters, all bets are off. He wants to be Dalmi's knight in shining armor, who also happens to knit, and he shows up at the networking event in all his glow-up glory. From here on out, it is a battle of wits and will between Nam Dosan and Good Boy as both fall for Dalmi while they are basically catfishing her Cyrano style. Who did you root for? Who deserves Dalmi in the end? And why do you think this debate is so devices? Buckle up, folks. <laughs> <sighs> <laughs> okay so i'm gonna get a little personal here but it is our podcast and we can do what we want 
but it explains so very much why I resonated with Nam Dosan and why I was rooting for him literally from the moment that the flower petal floats onto his mop of hair as he sits hunched over his computer. And not just rooting for his romance with Dami, but rooting for him. Basically, I married Nam Dosan in American Caucasian form. We actually met online first. He swears it was him typing and not some Cyrano. And I did fall in love with him over written words, even if I didn't admit it then. But the first time I ever saw Neil was when he was at his computer in his tiny dorm room at college, hunched over the keyboard, typing with his bitten off nails. Does that remind <laughs> you of Nam Dosan? I think so. Does Neil have text neck? Yes. <laughs> when I met him, was he a total nerd who didn't have social skills and didn't know how to communicate like at all? Did he even meet my eyes? No, he didn't. But yes, he was all those things. Does he well actually me on a daily basis because illogical arguments bother him? Yes. Would he hate basing someone's personality on blood type? 100%. (laughs) Do his coworkers call him a robot who needs to power down at night? Also, yes. And look, my husband was very similar to Namdo San in that he had no personal connections, except he had a college degree. He worked jobs he didn't necessarily like in the tech industry, but that were necessary for experience. And now he, like Nam Dosan, is a CTO. And he worked his ass off for it based on his skills alone. It wasn't his charming personality. I can tell you that. (laughs) (laughs) Just real quick aside, his very first job was just like an IT assistant. Okay, He just had to like help people fix their computers at some office. And he had like a woman like call him to her office and she was like I can't it was like she had an email and she's like I can't open up the attachment and it was like about insurance or something and she was clicking on the word attachment in the email <coughs> like <coughs> why can't <laughs> like I feel bad laughing but like and again Neil was like 22 at the time okay he had he had like a computer science degree he, this was not what he wanted to do but like this is where he found a job you know and he said <laughs> he said that he just walked over to her computer Double clicked on the attachment and walked away. He didn't say a word. If that's not Namdo San, I don't know what is. So, anyway, sorry for that short semi love letter with some subtle criticisms to my husband, but I had to explain what it is about Namdo San that first drew me in. Like, reader, I married him. And we all come at dramas from our own life experiences, and those completely color how we see a drama. So, for me, I don't think I could really do anything but love Nam Do San when I have been like practically married to him for 15 years. Did I love Good Boy? 100%. But if you give me like a scrappy software developer with zero social skills, I'm like a cat in heat. It's like how I'm wired, okay? And my feelings were validated by how Namdo San acted on screen. So his devotion to Dalmi was pretty damn epic from trusting her with his company to spending his entire three year stint in California studying self driving cars just in case he ever had to help Dalmi. So it was the small things he did on screen like pick up her sweater after it fell on the floor and place it back on her chair. He made a whole damn app for her grandmother who was losing her eyesight. He knitted her RGB sponges. I just, I just can't. I can't with that man. So there, that's my love letter to Namdo San, one of my favorite heroes of all time. I know this drama is divisive and that does make me sad because I really found it to be fantastic. And it's crazy because I have never ever tweeted about a drama and gotten so many like heated responses like I do when I tweet about startup. I mean, it's wild. It's fine. It's fine. I'll I'll say what I need to say. Like, you know, no one can stop me on here except you two. And you know that I was just going to go off and you're letting me. Like, I, you don't understand, guys. I like typed up an entire page. But anyway, I, I loved Good Boy so, so much. I really did. I loved his arc. I just didn't think his arc was a romance with Dami. And that's also why I don't always love the versus argument, I guess, when it comes to this drama. Even I mean, the drama definitely did pit them against each other. Because Good Boy had his own lessons to learn. You know, I also rather spend my time talking up Nando San rather than explaining why Good Boy and Dami weren't a, great, a good fit. And I talk a little later about what I loved about Good Boy's arc because I did find it really special and rewarding as a viewer. So, yeah, Nando San forever. Thanks for letting me have a mini TED talk on the podcast about it. And I will take questions. <laughs> and I, I no will pray because, for your safety. Yeah. <laughs> I have no questions because I was team Nam Dosan for this too. And again, not because I didn't love Good Boy. Nam Dosan was the right hero for Dalmi. Mm -hmm. 
<sighs> this is not in this like in this area, but I'm gonna just throw it in here <laughs> because like I would say that I was probably team good boy and like who I like liked the best. However, like for the people who are just like very like still just in their feelings that this character didn't get the girl. Like, it just wasn't the girl for him. I don't know what to say. Like, it legit just wasn't the girl for him. And so I say that as, like, you know, I was, like, all in on the good boy story and didn't think Delmi was the girl for him. So I had, like, no real drama in feeling sad because I was like, you're going to find your perfect fictional person, but this ain't it. And that's okay. So that's where I get stumped because I'm like, really? It just wasn't, like, the perfect fit. And so I can live in peace. But what I want to talk about is the writer for this. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I will take questions. (laughs) Well, no. (laughs) Well, no. I was just going to say, like, it almost felt like to me, like, Startup was Good Boy's prequel. His, like, he had, like, he kind of just, he had to get to a certain place before he was ready for a romance. And I feel like this drama, he got there. And now, well, I mean, just listen to our second male lead, SOS. Right. Okay. Because Leah gives gives him an HEA. I just love the I just love seeing the tail go across Leah's screen. Of course, just the yeah. As we're uh, podcasting, my ca- this cat. I we'll get into the cat another time, but it's a lot <laughs> yeah. to deal with. Okay, so the writer for this drama is Park Hai Ryun, and like she's no newbie. She's done a lot of popular dramas. Um, a few of the most notable are I Can Hear Your Voice, Dream High, and Pinocchio, and you know, what I thought was interesting was how divisive this drama has been for people and how a lot of that just like naturally falls out on like the writer. And so A, like good for you writer for creating characters that made people feel so many feelings. And also like, mm-hmm. I don't hug, but like, you know, a thumbs up from a like, you know, distance to you for like weathering what feels like a lot of like it's hard when people are just like fucking pissed about at you on the internet for something you've created (laughs) so i wanted to share Mm -hmm. two headlines from two different news articles i found that came out after the finale of startup the first one is why the writing failed in all capital letters nam ju hyuk's (laughs) nam do san kong han na's in j and the audience And then we have another one that the headline said, Startup, a finale that brings a natural, mature ending. (laughs) And I was just like, well, like how different that's just like how shit goes. And I mean, I guess that's like my thing is I always think it's interesting when people get a lot of passion about things. And I think that Mm -hmm. all like creative work, when stuff is divisive, Look, it's interesting. And I think what's interesting is that it shows how like human we all are and like what's hitting our buttons in different ways. Um, Mm -hmm. So do I think the writing failed in this? No. Do I think the writing was perfect in this? No. And I'll talk about that later. Like, I don't think this is like a perfect drama. And this wasn't my top drama. I enjoyed it. Um, I watched it before the two of you. And I was Mm -hmm. really like... I think I was surprisingly invested in it because I really wasn't like, this was like not something I was feeling like watching. And when we had, um, we did a giveaway and one of our listeners, like in one of our giveaways was you could pick any drama and we're going to watch it and do a deep dive on it, which I should have acknowledged too. That's why we're doing this. And that was like, the nexus of that was, um, you know, Megan Hernandez, absolute mommy won the giveaway and picked startup. And here we are. And so, as I was watching it, I was like, this is actually like very good. And something I want to say too about Good Boy's character is we were having a conversation about men this week, Amy and Megan and I. And Megan accidentally like had a typo and she said, he's really unemotionally available. She wasn't talking about No, me. I said it in a podcast. Oh, okay. Oh. It was in a podcast. You were editing a podcast <laughs> and apparently you caught yeah. yourself saying, using the phrase unemotionally available. That's right. Instead of emotionally unavailable. Yes. It's an emotion- and I loved it so much, A, because it reminded <laughs> me of my husband, but also like, it also made me feel very much like kind of this is where good boy's at in this drama. Yes. Is like, he's very unemotionally available for you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. And so like. 100%. Look, 
I love a basket of boo-boos and a good man um, or, you know, who thinks he's a bad boy and is like trying to be a good man. Like all that stuff really like that's just like my like catnip, like banana split Sunday to like get into. But I think what really also gets people in this is that, you know, love triangles are, can be divisive. And I think a lot of K-dramas kind of softball the love triangles where there's like clearly the leads and then there's kind of like the second male lead that they kind of like insert every once in a while. But like, you know, he's not really going to like get the girl. He may have like his own cool story, but like he's not really like a threat to like the main character. Whereas right. in this one, like, look, I knew Good Boy was never like, I mean, I anyone who was surprised, like it was pretty clear Good Boy was like never coming home. Right, if with, you were like, surprised that Good Boy, I, I don't know. I don't know what, what to say. say to that. Like it was pretty clear <laughs> to me, but I feel like what they did was they very much emotionally invested yes. you. So that's why I can see that people have this reaction of like, why the F did you emotionally invest me in this person? We get to see him first too, which also like in K-drama, like there's certain like conventions. And look, I've seen other scents that like I can't get into because we can't talk about them because you haven't seen them yet. But like where you're introduced to like one hero and like you get invested and then all of a sudden you're like, oh, that's actually not going to be the guy. So I think that like some of this kind of just went in the face of what some of the conventions are in K-drama too, but... And I was going to say, what I really like about getting emotionally invested in G Pyong slash Good Boy and this idea of him being unemotionally available is that, you know what? A basket of boo-boos is absolutely catnip, but a basket of boo-boos is not ready for a relationship. And so I like, I like whoever brought up that this is Good Boy's prequel. Um, was that you, Megan? Did you say that? I, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. There's th only three of us, and I can't remember who said what. But, like, <laughs> he okay. is a basket of boo-boos, and he is starting to heal at the end. And that's mm -hmm. why he's ready for a relationship in Leah's second male lead, SOS. So, yeah, I like that. Yeah, and I also found, like, his story was great. Like, I, I, do, I do completely understand. Like, I know there are people who are, like, very angry because they felt like you had, especially because episode one, they really emotionally invested um, you in this character, which I get, but then he was also like a high school kid then. I don't know. I mean, I care. I also think this. Megan thing. doesn't care about I high school okay. people in dramas, is basically what it gets down well, to. Yeah. <laughs> go to. Go back to Goblin. <laughs> Look, Megan just yeah. likes Dosan, and people are going to have to like pray for us no, or no, no, like no, want to no. murder us. <laughs> no, no, no. This is the thing. I cared about Good Boy. I don't know why <laughs> caring about Good Boy means I have to think he's in a he should ha get the get, get the girl like be yeah. in the romance. You know what I mean? Like I, you can be emotionally invested in Good Boy from jump and still be happy with his arc because he had one. He did. He like he had a great one. So I don't understand why people are upset just because he didn't like get a woman like he'll be fine he actually like probably and Delmi, is gonna have some therapy Delmi's just not it for good boy it's just no not Delmi, it. like just not it and i'm gonna no. talk later about like i like dosan Delmi. i'm iffy you're on but like they were a better match in my opinion like personality wise yeah. and characterization wise good boy no and when we've been alluding a few times this thing second male lead sos um, so for folks who are like, I don't know. I mean, like as we were coming to do the startup pod beyond the scandal that was emerging, like as we <laughs> started to record this, we're also very cognizant that this is a drama that could be getting some people to listen to for the first time, just because I don't know. Anytime startup is talked about, it's like meerkats popping their heads out of holes to be like, <laughs> you know, let's like, oh, it is. And I don't, I mean, I'm here for like it. Like people on Twitter just popping up all over the place. It. If you're a person on Twitter that pops up on this, like you pop yeah. off and I love it. Yeah. But um, yeah, I think that, okay. So Second Millie SOS is a podcast that we do kind of like quarterly where we give a Second Millie that we particularly connected with kind of like the HEA story that we really think they deserved. So if you listen to us a lot, you'll know that the second male lead SOS came out right before the airing of this drama. If you're like new to us, you might want to check it out. I did do a whole story for Good Boy that hopefully gives some peace and closure to people. No, it's epic. It's so good. And like Studio Dragon should be like calling you. Yeah. If you like Good Boy, you got to listen to to Leah's um to Leah's HEA she gave him because it's toot my horn. Like, honestly. Burp, 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 no, you burp, should burp, toot your burp, horn because and honestly, I was like <laughs> I was ready to keep listening. Like you cut it short. And I was like, no, <laughs> keep going, please. It was great. Right. I would have kept going, but I guess not now. <laughs>
And I do want to say, too, like, yeah, Startup isn't my fa- I, I wouldn't say it's like my favorite drama. I really, really liked it. But I would say Namdo Sun is one of my favorite heroes. So that's kind of how I'm wording that and why I went on a huge rant about Namdo Sun. He freaking knits. He does. Or maybe it's crochet because right. then I got a tweet that was like, I said he knits. And someone's like, actually, that is a crocheted. You know, well, actually, animal. and I was like, oh, well, sorry. actually. Well, actually, yeah. Namdo Sun well, came actually, in the he chat knits, and let me he know. He crochets and he knits. So I don't oh, know. Okay, great. That. So he's multi. It was a knitting yeah. club that they made in college. So it it was a yeah. knitting club. Just so you know, my husband, my husband can't knit. knit. That's Let's okay. See. He can only do code like Namdo San. Actually, it's funny because there were a couple scenes where she like brings him snacks, like while he's like just hunched over the like zoned out in his like coding and. Like that was me in college. Neil would like he wouldn't even like work in the computer lab. He would just like sit at the end of like a dark hallway in like the computer science building. I don't know why, because he's weird. And he would be like hunched over his computer and I'd like slide him like pepperoni sticks from the from the dining hall and then like leave. And he wouldn't even he'd just be like, Thank you. And then he'd like keep robot typing. <laughs> pepperoni sticks. <laughs> Oh, I don't know goodness. why that like detail is just like the back of your slide. <laughs> Baby, I got you some uh, pepperoni, pepperoni sticks. sticks. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you. Is that how Neil talks in life? Thank you. And, well, he's like, there, there, it, there are people back and forth giving each other sausage sticks in hometown cha cha cha. So <laughs> there's yeah, a lot of exchanging sausage of sausage sticks. sticks, but they're never refrigerated. So I guess they're like Slim Jims. I, I feel like they're like beef jerky. Yeah, it's like beef, right? Because they're not refrigerated. So it's like, yes, they should be. But in some, they're white. I have. And Yumi sells, they're thick and white. They look like taffy almost. They're like white and thick. Right. And do they just bite into it like a hot dog? I think so. Yeah, I think you just <laughs> into it. Huh. Okay. I I'm going to go to H Mart over the hill and see if I can get one. I'll eat one and tell you. Do it. Okay. Yeah, we want to report. <laughs> Processed meat is... Uh, interest of mine <laughs> okay let's Just keep going let's move on, <laughs> shall we all right so we are past the namdo san Pyong good boy situation so let's talk supporting cast because samsung tech <laughs> was not merely do san's endeavor his two besties chul san played by yu su bin and young san played by kim do wan were the other two sons in samsung tech then we had stephanie lee as the too cool for school saha who was your favorite Samsung Tech team member? So his besties were everything. They had such a wonderful friendship that just felt really like special and non-toxic. K-dramas, in my opinion, do friendship like so freaking well. And to see these guys support each other through everything was so heartwarming. I mean, they were so loyal. I remember when Young San and Do San were bawling outside of Chul San's <laughs> hospital room because they thought he went blind and then... <laughs> From milk, because he got milk they- in his eyes. Because he got milk in his eyes and then they all rushed in and cried and hugged each other and like <laughs> the doctors and nurses were just like staring at them. Oh my God. I don't know why that scene just made me so happy because you knew he was okay. And I just, I just love it. And real quick, I just want to say that. So Kim Do Wan and the actress who plays In Jay are like a couple in My Roommate is a Gumi. Oh, so just a little fun fact. I did there. not know yeah. that. Oh, that is exciting. That's fun because I was kind of hoping for more of a romantic arc in startup for them. So yeah, the actress who plays in J is in my roommate is a Gomeo, and I love her character. So to- totally different, like totally different character. So I love Tulsan. I think that, you know, the actor who who plays him, Yusu Bin, who was also in um Crash Landing on You. Loved him in that I mean, so much. He was a, such a steam scene stealer for me in Crash Landing on You as like the K drama obsessed North Korean soldier, just like her, sobbing away. I don't know. Like so relatable I for the audience. It. I, I love know. it. And I think that he is so fun to me because in this drama too, he just brings like such good emotions and like, yes, that they're kind of like played broad and they're meant to be kind of sometimes like a bit of like a tongue and cheek joke. But like, honestly, there's like an earnestness and a sweetness to it that is just really appealing and endearing. So, I mean, I liked all the Samsung Tech guys, but I felt like, you know, I don't know, Chulsan just like had like a little extra 
going for me. He's becoming one of my like kind of almost favorite like. I love him. I do. Yeah, he, I would yeah. watch him in anything. When he's so when great. Saha kissed him in the copy room and he just basically like collapsed on the floor when she walked. Like he was <laughs> holding his shit together and then she walks out of the room and he just literally melts into a puddle on the floor. Like that was the cutest, sweetest thing I've ever seen. Yeah. I loved it. And watching yeah. the three of them on that boat. Oh my god, the freaking like, boat. <laughs> The yacht, <laughs> like because apparently when life. you go to California, when you go to Silicon Valley, you work from a freaking yacht and eat fruit plates, <laughs> fruit and cheese plates. <laughs> so Amy was like, we were talking about this and she was like, I mean, how do they even get Wi-Fi on the boat? And I was like, that's a good question. So I go to Neil and I was like, so I just didn't even tell him the context. I was like, can you get Wi-Fi on a yacht? And he just looked at me like deadpan. It was like satellite. Yeah. That's all he said because he can't use full sentences. <laughs> and I was like, okay. And he acted like I was stupid and then for not you're knowing. You're like, have a pepperoni stick, Neil. But like, yeah, here's a pepperoni like, stick. Okay, but it need... wasn't even like, I know that you can get it, but like your signal cannot be that good <laughs> that you right? are like He's writing like, code YouTube. for a self driving right. car on a freaking right. yacht. Ludicrous. Sorry. I, I just know. like that they were like, we need to show that they are like, it was like such a self congratulatory moment of like these. We need to show right. that they've gone to the U.S. and they've really made it. However, really, we don't have the budget to like be in the U.S., so we need to put them on the ocean. That was it. For, and that's like, I mean, like that checks out. I'm like, okay, well, you need to show them successful America. I can't get them to America. I mean, there's an ocean off California. <laughs> put them on the ocean. Fuck. <laughs> And, and there like, they are. This is what our budget will allow. That was that <laughs> was the only on boat. right. That was the only footage from "Quote Unquote America." Was the three of them <laughs> yeah. on a yacht with yeah. their laptops, <laughs> laptops and like food smugly, plates. like with their wine too. There's always like wine and like some self congratulation. Yeah. yeah, and like talking about like talking about hair. wine, like they're like they're sommeliers now. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so great it was so dorky and awesome meanwhile they used to have that like rooftop like roach infested office i mean it was like the glow up was <laughs> i guess that's what happens when you go to silicon valley like you know you're just automatically now you wear long coats and turtlenecks yeah and the next question i had is how much are you making in silicon valley because i mean like you bet like the rent for like right? a one bedroom apartment is like five thousand dollars so for you to be pulling like yacht coding money like you know, you better be in this fucking C suite. <laughs> you got the yacht oh, office. Oh god. Right. I love their glow up. I loved it I so did. much. I really did. Okay. Wait, I just want to say one thing about uh, th about this is this was one of the only dramas where I actually didn't mind like a time jump. I usually really hate that, but I felt like it made sense. Like I actually was okay with it. Like the time jump in Edawan class was in my opinion the worst thing ever, but uh, they did a time jump and like a lot the characters had grown, but yet it still felt like a cohesive drama and probably because it was all still done at the sandbox. So I still felt like, I don't know, they still felt kind of scrappy. I like the time jump no, to a point. No, you don't point. think so? No, I like the time jump to a point. I okay. think it was good for the relationship and for Samsung Tech. I right. thought that the good boy right. Del Me dynamic in the time jump was weird because like they kind of kept it in still like a little weird holding pattern it was, it was muddied yeah for sure yeah it was much more muddied and so when people give like a wag of the finger there i think it's very valid i think it was good for the romance just not great for good boy right to have him be a regular part of her life yeah i agree i do agree yeah all right Juan and jay could have been a two-dimensional villain but instead had some great growth herself throughout the drama did you find her to be a good foil for Dalmi and vice versa? And more importantly, should there have been a secondary romance between her and good boy? Ooh, see what I did there. Mm. <laughs> I injected my feelings into the question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I thought she was a really good foil rather than just a rival. She was also her sister. Right. I mean, a relative, which made all the tensions that much more heightened. And while I actually do think NJ and good boy would be a good match, I'm kind of glad that NJ didn't have an on-screen love interest. I don't know, there was something about the fact that I liked that they just kind of let her shine without a man. But I do think good boy should have a woman. I would pair him sort of with a woman like NJ, I think. Pretty, pretty self-assured. I liked NJ. I like the actress who plays NJ. Um, I've seen her in like somewhat similar roles where she does like kind of like the cold and like is kind of like a bit villainous. So in um, Scarlet Heart, 
uh, Moon Lovers, like definitely she like nails that too. But to me, this was a character. Okay, that, who isn't in that drama? What's that? Who is it? Who isn't no, in that drama? Who isn't in that drama? Everyone in their like dog is in that. I mean, seriously, everyone is in that drama. But anyway, to me, this character, here's where I thought that the writing started to kind of like get weak was like, you know, stuff like we had talked with the time jump and like Good Boy and like Del Me. And then also for me with NJ, like I felt like there was like some excellent sister tension set up. But that the payoff actually, mm-hmm. and to me, emotionally felt like underwhelming by the end. Like I enjoyed this character and that she was a flawed person. And I felt like that she did provide a great foil to Bay Susie's character, who to me, look, I just thought Delmi was fine, but was kind of like that blandly perfect girl next door. Like, I mean, she was fine and she was like, she had more to her than that. But like, she felt kind of just like a little like, perfectly like one dimensional more to me and I think I just wanted overall like in that second half to have more like meaty good like sister goodness there as they like came to like their reconciling and then moving on and like I don't think either of you neither of you have sisters right no not that I know of no (laughs) (laughs) I have two and I'm raising two and I feel like with sisters like there's so much drama and love and conflict and I do really think that like we were getting it and then it kind of just like fell to the side more. Like I wanted to see some like really big scenes between those two sisters more is what I think I wish I had. That's fair. I would have liked that too because they were so close before the divorce. And so I wanted to see that rift repaired. And I mean, it was in a way like, I mean, they work together now and they're a team, Mm -hmm. but we didn't see that like, Re-establishing of their love for each other, yeah, or like hashing out like the big, big feels. It just kind of like started to happen again. Yeah. Uh, one thing about Dami, she reminded me a little bit of Park Sarah Wee from Edawan class. Just kind of one of those like very good kind of altruistic alpha types. Because I mean, I would say that Dami was a little bit of an alpha. She was definitely like a leader, mm-hmm. and. Those characters are just not like personally like my favorite. I think, and that's and that's just a personal thing. Like I'm sure there are some people, like I know plenty of people love Park Sohui. Like that's their that is their type of character. They, they love that, and I think Dalmi kind of hits those same buttons for those people. But I mean, like I said, I liked her. I thought she was great. She was just very much, yeah, like I said, one of those really good altruistic characters. Well, and also for me, like when I was thinking about like my quibble with it, the reason why I like ultimately, like I was able to kind of be like, yeah, it's fine, is because the two male leads, because I'm saying good boy's a male lead, basically. The two male yeah. leads yeah, I agree. were just like damaged and flawed and had issues. And so even though like Dosan, mm-hmm. like, you know, he was he was effed up in a different way. <laughs> Like, you know, they both had their baggage and their issues. And so she was kind of a mess, too. I think it could have just been like, this is just too much of a mess. Whereas, like, having her kind of just being, like, good and an ingenue who's, like, scrappy and, like, believes in the good fight and stuff. Like, that's fine. Like, Mm -hmm. I mean, like, it fit for what the drama was trying to be. Like, I mean, like... Yeah, she she didn't feel a water bottle to me. Like, she had, like, she had depth and she had a journey. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I think yeah. She had a journey. I do agree, though, that I'm kind of glad they didn't give her some like really messy background. I mean, she still had kind of a traumatic. Yeah. Here's a question I have, though, like while we're talking about this is why in the divorce did each parent get one and neither the two like that? Like, I still was just like such a weird like, well, you get to go. It was like the parent trap. Be with like poor dad and you're going to go be with rich mom. And like the end. And it's like, well. Yeah. But didn't but they like, choose? Didn't they choose who they went with? Well, they with? chose, but like, why did they have to? Because it was like, that was it. Did they, like, then there was like no But like, did they have to, did they have to choose somebody different? Like, I don't, I don't know if that was the situation. No, no, like, I think they, they could have they, chose, they could have chose either parent. Like, they both could have gone with the mom. It was just the right. fact that like, like, once you chose, you were done. That's it. Right. right. Why does that mean that their relationship's over? Yeah. Well, because they went to the States and that's what happens when you go to the States. <laughs> you don't like ever like reach out to yeah, your family. They, I again. love how they kind of refer it like if Yeah, it's like when you go to the States, you're just like different planet. No man's land. <laughs> yeah, you're like <laughs> Yeah, there's there's no yeah. Zoom, there's no Skyping, there's no phone calls, there's no planes. Yeah. It's just like a black. No, box. this was pre COVID. Yeah. You couldn't do any of that stuff. <laughs> yeah. Especially if you were really wealthy. 
because you got to like right. with the rich mom. <laughs> I mean, you could have done it from a yacht. Could have Skyped anyway. from a yacht. Oh my God, amazing. Freaking love the yacht. So which of our four leads, Sadal Mi, Nam Da San, Han Ji Pyong, or Wan In Jae, do you think had the best arc or growth throughout the drama? So I would say probably Han Ji Pyong with Nam Do San being a close second. So to me, Nam Do San's arc was mostly about maturity and like speaking up for himself and also believing in himself. And a lot of that was just him like growing up a little in the drama. He really came across to me almost as like a new adult hero, like an early 20s hero. I'm not sure if they ever gave us his age, but he definitely felt like young to mid 20s to me, just the way he acted. I think that three year time gap did a lot. But Ji Pyong, I mean, that man was repressed. He was unemotionally available. He had no real support network or friends. And by the end of this drama, he got both. So there were a lot of growing pains getting there. But he went from being, you know, totally awkward at having anyone in his space or being vulnerable to having a card game on the floor of his living room and falling asleep on Granny's couch. Like it was a really <laughs> great progression. <laughs> it was a really great pro progression to see him smile at the end as a part of a team rather than sitting behind his desk in that large office, like closed off from the rest of his employees. Like even just that visual, if you think about it, just that the whole visual thing of all his employees were kind of like together talking and good boy just had that, like, you know, his desk that was at the front with his computer. So he didn't actually have to like look at anyone or interact with anyone. And they didn't show him like, like I said, he didn't have any friends except for that, like, freaking alexa like <laughs> thing that, that was really good to. you know what i'm saying yeah. yeah i love that but i mean he really didn't have friends he, and he, like he, he had he granny didn't have... all he had was granny that was the only friend he had <laughs> well yeah but he didn't even reconnect with her until no you know he had a long time so with what no saying. he just yeah and so i just really liked that he had that progression like that again he let people in his space you know he kind of like loosened up he took off his tie like just you know, I just, I really, I love that. He did. He had great growth. I loved his, I loved his story. His story just wasn't meant for him to get the girl. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> What's going on there, Leah? The cat just bit my feet. <laughs> You're like, <laughs> they love, they do love Yeah, I, they like to bite toes. I just want to say my, my cat literally did lick my lips at like four o'clock in the morning. Just walked right up and just like licked them. And Neil thinks you're ridiculous for throwing a steak away because your cat had its face in it. Well, tell Neil, Mr. <laughs> Pepperoni stick in the hallway. <laughs> so we got a cat, the TLDR. We got a cat. The cat's a lot. And I was marinating some skirt steak yesterday or the day before. And the cat went in the kitchen and stuck his face in the skirt steak marinating. And I threw it away. The end. Because I don't eat things that the cat has stuck its face in. You cook it right off. You cook off that. Yeah, Neil goes, wait, it was raw? So she could have cooked it and it would all cook out. <laughs> I mean, I. What would you do if a dog just like licked a bowl of food? You'd cook it? Probably, yeah. Dog is a little bit different. Just, dog has like actual slobber. Cats don't have slobber. Yeah. It's just that sandpaper. It's like, yeah. I don't know. I don't have a dog, we, so I don't we know. We all feel strongly. We 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 want to defend your poor steak. We do. We would have eaten the steak. That's all I'm going to say. So I just want to give a quick shout out to Kim Ju Hun, who I loved in It's Okay Not to Be Okay as Dalmi and Injay's father, uh, Sa Chung Myung. After all, his story about laying out sand for Dalmi under the swing was the catalyst for Sandbox's creator, Yoon Sun Hak, to start the incubator project, as well as her inspiration for Sandbox's logo, which I loved, the girl on the swing. So I just wanted to toss that out because I loved him and it's okay. And I, I, I thought he was a great dad in this one. I do, like I said, I do take issue, not with the fact that he died, but with his poor decision-making <laughs> to cross the street when the crosswalk said not to, <laughs> and then didn't go to the doctor and let it, let it like bleeding from his brain. He was bleeding from his brain, bleeding from his brain. Yeah. And is giving a presentation. <laughs> I did find it pretty depressing and then they just showed this like bus and he had like he died, died on the bus on the bus and it's just with like fried chicken like body bringing just... fried chicken home for his daughter oh God. yeah it was it was pretty tragic so that was that episode was actually really rough for me because like i was just waiting like at what point is he gonna die because you know he is so i was just so nervous right. for when it was gonna happen and, and was dalmi gonna witness it 
So anyway, right. any final thoughts about startup that you must get off your chest? Maybe, I mean, we already talked about the, the yacht, so I'm over it. I'm over, I'm over discussing it. I'm not over them working on the yacht, but maybe, I don't know, the mm-hmm. money tree, something. What do you want to say? Well, who's surprised that I still have more stuff to say? <laughs> So I just want to mention a couple lines that stuck out to me in this drama because I really, really love the dialogue. Uh, one is when Nam Dosan is asked about his dream in reference to his career and all he can think about is Dalmi. And, you know, I just love Nam Dosan. He's kind of like a man of few words. And he responds, you know, like he always does. What if my dream is a person? I loved it. That's and when I was in. That's I, when I was all in. I, I yep, even messaged you. You messaged yeah. us that line. I was like, that's it. And I agree. That line is so good. And so there's this whole thread throughout the drama. Um, basically, Dosan is obviously like insecure about the fact that he's being deceptive. And he thinks she's clearly in love with the Nam Dosan of the letters and not the Nam Dosan that he actually is. And he asks her, what do you like about me? And she tells him like things she likes about the Dosan that wrote her letters. And the only thing she says about him is that she says, I like your big hands which maybe sounds corny, but in the moment it was, it was good dialogue. And you can tell he's like, he like looks at his hands a lot. Like that really, he's like trying to puzzle it out in his head. Like, why does she like my hands? And he thinks it's a little trivial. Um, and then later we get Dalmi's point of view that Dosan's hands have like a lot, like they're almost, it's almost like metaphorical support. Like you know, when he first shows up in that like glow up and she's very like nervous and she's faltering and he kind of like grips her hand in his big ones. And it's like just that like physical support and, you know, metaphorical support or whatever is a lot. So there, there's more to it. And if you watch the drama, you'll get it. But I really love the whole thread throughout the plot. And anyway, when Good Boy finally realizes that Dalmi and Dosan are end game, he tells Dosan to go to her. But Dosan still doesn't really, you know, believe it. And he says, you know, but she loved your letters and she only loves me for my big hands. And Ji Pyong tells him, well, with those hands, you beat our memories. And oh my God. I know, I know. <gasps> when that dialogue came in, I sent it to Leah because you hadn't watched it yet, Amy. And I sent that to Leah in all capital letters. I was losing my shit. I just thought that was amazing dialogue. And it was great growth for Good Boy. Like, I love that he said that. It and was. he even said, he like, he went on to say like, it took me 15 years to go to her after reading her letters. It took you one day. Like, clearly yeah. you are the hero here. And then I also love when she asked, when he asks her again, why do you, why do you like me? And she's like, why do I have to have a reason? It's just because you're you, mm-hmm. which I mean, mm-hmm. they're clearly meant to be meant to mm-hmm. be. Yeah. They're like a couple that I believe will, will do yes. great. Like their HEA is one that I fully believe. Yep. And good boy will not lose his chance next woman. I can tell you that. He's ready. He's ready now. He's ready. He will run to her right away with, with some sort of glow up. Well, he doesn't really need no, a glow up. No, he does not anymore. need a glow up. He needs, a, he, needs an, he, has, he has his emotional glow up now. Yes. And he'll be, he'll be just fine. And speaking of the money tree, I have one and my cats have almost killed it. I can't have plants in my house because my cats will eat them. I'll post a picture of my, of my money tree when this episode comes out. You all can see, and you can see that my husband's looks freaking great. So I don't know what it means. They're just destroying me, yours, but they're just destroying mine. So to toss out there without get, I don't want to give any spoilers because in the way heroes are introduced um, is the court series by Sarah J. Mass, and it starts with a court of thorns and roses, and then the second book is a court of mist and fury, and the third book is a court of wings and ruin. And I will just go. It is a fantasy series that starts with a girl who gets kidnapped by a fairy and the fairies in this realm are shapeshifters. And so this one in particular is a shapeshifting wolf and there are, everybody shifts into something like they have a human form and then they have an animal form. And anyway, I don't want to give too much away because the whole love triangle thing unfolds across the entire series but it's super well done. And the first book, A Court of Thorns and Roses, I loved. Leah loved it as well. The second book, A Court of Mist and Fury, is probably one of my favorite books of all time. And it's a book two in a series, which is weird, I think. Because usually book twos are kind of like the saggy middle of a series. I mean, not always, but like they can be. They can be like the bridge to like 
all the excitement that happens in book three. And I will just say that book two is one of my favorite books that I've ever read. It is billed as a young adult series, but it has some pretty graphic fairy sex going on in uh, in book two. <laughs> um, it it is it is some sexy, sexy stuff. I mean, there are people who like you know, we're t- who had t-shirts when we were at a conference and Sarah J. Mass was there. There are people who had t-shirts that said something just like the page number of like this sex scene on it. And I do not blame them. It's a scene that I have read more than once. It is one of the sexiest things I've ever read. But anyway, it's the court series by Sarah J. Mass. Like I said, it's billed as young adult, but I would say it's much more top tier young adult and has some adult consensual sex, but there's, there's some on page stuff that goes on there. So I I think you should check it out. It's fantasy. It's like I said, the second book is one of my favorite books I've ever read. And it's a great love triangle. So we appreciate you listening to this podcast. I think it was one of our longer ones, which we kind of knew it was going to be because I can't stop talking about Namdo San. But we really, you know, we want to hear your feedback. So let us know, you know, what you think on Twitter, on Instagram, you know, whatever you feel comfortable on we'd love to we'd love to hear your feedback just don't be mean okay we're allowed to like what we like you can like okay? every, we're not gonna yuck anybody's and you can dislike yeah, it that's fine yeah and you can you can totally dislike it okay so it, it's all okay <laughs> all right okay so we will see you next week as always Annyeong. Annyeong. Thank you for listening to Afternoon of Delight. Make sure to subscribe for more great K-Romance conversation. And be sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Afternoon of Delight Podcast for more information on our podcast, behind-the-scenes photos, and, of course, pics of our favorite opas and unis. Annyeong!